Welcome to episode three of Continuum Meditations Discusses. In this episode, we advance my examination of Rogue One, a Star Wars story with looks at characters Bodhi Rook and Saw Gerrera. But before I begin, let me say that the recent loss of Carrie Fisher has brought forth a cascade of love and emotion from millions of fans around the world. And I believe this an appropriate response to a woman whose talent inspired so many and whose candid admissions of our own life struggles aided others to receive the help they so desperately needed. Carrie Fisher, you will be missed. We continue now with part three of my analysis of Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Okay, so the character who I believe really got the short end of the stick in this movie was Bodhi Rook, played by Riz Ahmed. Bodhi Rook seemed like a kind of an everyman, uh, he, his motivation was, well, you know, I'm here, and at least it seemed to me, his motivation was, I'm here, and I have escaped uh, imperial servitude. I don't know if the guy was conscripted in the story, or if he actually volunteered as an imperial pilot, but however he did it, he escaped. He brought information to Saul Guerrera, and that led him into the path of Jen Erso, and then ultimately it led him into the path of the Rebel Alliance, and ultimately from there into being a part of Rogue One. Somewhat inadvertently and somewhat kind of, uh, I think, you just, you just happened to fall into it. So to me, Bodhi Rook was the character who I do in fact believe was the least developed of all the main part of the ensemble in the storyline. Now, however, that in my opinion, while I do think he deserves some more time to tell us why he was there, it was, again, something I understood, I accepted, and I recognize the part that he needed to play in the storyline. Um, he is a kind of an everyman in, in Rogue One. And maybe something of a reluctant everyman too, from what I could, from what I read of the character. I think you see this as he is being, uh, you, know, you wanna call it tortured. Yeah, I wanna call it being tortured. I think you see this as he was kind of being tortured for information by Saul Guerrero when that tentacle creature kind of looked like some kind of big, deformed octopus uh, with all these tentacles, you know, wrapped itself around him and Saul Guerrero told him effectively, you know, this creature will be able to tell if you're lying or not because you're, uh, of how your uh, psyche and your emotions will change and he'll, and, and if you're lying, he'll, he'll mess you up, he'll, he'll start to make you go crazy. So Bodhi Rook was kind of, you know, subjected to that, he was subjected to Baze Malbus threatening to kill him, uh, and in the end, of course, we saw that uh, Bodhi Rook was blown to smithereens when one of the Scarif stormtroopers uh, threw this grenade into their uh, into the landed shuttle while he was trying to get a message out to the Rebel Alliance fleet uh, above the skies of Scarif, um, you know, to get the Death Star plans out to them. But this character, although again, I understand his role in the movie and I understand. Uh, what part he had to play, I do think he did get the short end of the stick in terms of what his part was to be. So that when he actually died, when he was actually blown up, I really didn't feel it very much. I mean, I understood it. Uh, I appreciated it. Again, I think that this is part of the overall weakness of the story, that it did not develop some of these characters more, so that by the time we got to the ultimate act, third act, where all of this action was taking place and where it was all on the line, when these people went out, uh, when they bought it, you appreciated the fact of what they were doing, what they were trying to do, and why they were dying. And you, more than just appreciating it, you felt it. And you could say, man, I can see myself there fighting alongside Bodhi Rook. I could see myself fighting alongside Chirut Imwe and Baze Malbus. I can see myself dying alongside K2SO as he was shooting those stormtroopers who were overwhelming him inside that control room as he was trying to keep them out from getting to Jyn Erso and Cassian Andor as they were trying to retrieve the Death Star plans. And in many ways, except for maybe a few of, the, a hand, a few of these characters, again, Bodhi Rook, who we're focusing on here, you don't get that. And that, again, is my chief criticism with this movie and with Bodhi Rook, it's my chief criticism of him. He, get, he gets the real short end of the stick on this, uh, on this point. Uh, I did appreciate the character, but I really could not find myself 
being endeared to the character, to, aside from the fact that he was there. That is no testament, by the way, or no detriment to the uh, to the abilities of the actor. Riz Ahmed did a fine job with the, what part he was given, but to me it just seemed more like a bit part, and I would have liked to have seen a bit more uh, from that character in that regard. So now let's get to Saul Guerrera as played by Forrest Whitaker. Now, for those of you who don't know, Saul Guerrera is an original character from the Clone Wars animated series. He came in, I think, about the um, fourth season of Clone Wars, where he and his sister Stila Guerrera were to become resistance leaders against Count Dooku and against uh, the Federation of Independent Systems to take over his world for their purposes. Now, uh, ultimately, his sister Stila Guerrera is killed. She dies on their homeworld of Onderon in one of the last skirmishes uh, against Count Dooku's forces. And Saul Guerrera, from that point, is basically made the de facto leader uh, of the resistance on that world. Now, we don't know what happens in the intervening years, and this is something that I have learned recently that is going to be explored in the new Star Wars Rebels animated series, that they're going to actually have Saul Guerrero come back. And, interestingly enough, that he's going to be played by Forrest Whitaker in the animated series. So this should be able to fill in a few gaps, anyway, between the Clone Wars and Rogue One. However, the character that we see in Rogue One is the, the evolution of Saul Guerrero. He is, he goes from being the young, uh, feisty and fierce resistance leader in the Clone Wars to being what we see in Rogue One to looks to be interpreted as a very broken and somewhat uh, crazy old man who has seen and felt the scars of war. Okay, you see him with these uh, robotic legs in Rogue One which he does not have when you see him in Clone Wars. You see him with this very uh, cumbersome and loud breathing apparatus, which he, again, does not have in the Clone Wars. Um, and so something happens between point A to point B that we don't know about to make him this very hard, battle-hardened and, quite frankly, uh, off-the-rocker and somewhat off-kilter old man, okay? And I think Saul Guerrero played that effectively because you're seeing in this regard the costs of war. One of the characters in Star Wars Rebels said, Battles leave scars, some you can't see. And Saul Guerrero is definitely an example of that. Now, I've heard some criticisms that some people didn't like the way he sounded. Uh, and, you know, the way he, uh, Forrest Whitaker played the character, I didn't have a problem with this because it was so short in time and his character had such little screen time that the Saul Guerrero that you see in Rogue One is not, you know that he is not the same Saul Guerrero that you have known from the Clone Wars and probably won't be the same Saul Guerrero that we're going to see in an upcoming episode of Star Wars Rebels, all right? But... You see the costs of war have inflicted their toll upon this man, and I think that that's a good thing, because the kind of Saul Guerrero that you see in the Clone Wars is one who is willing to do whatever it takes in order to fight back against Count Dooku and his forces, all right? And apparently, that is the same Saul Guerrero who takes his fight from the uh, Clone Wars into his fight against the Empire. And he gets even more hardcore, even more battle-hardened, all right, even more extreme than he was in the Clone Wars, all right. So it's 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 a, it's an interesting development to me, and I personally found it to be a very logical and um, expected evolution. Now, if you don't know anything about Saul Guerrero, you might be saying, "Who the heck is this guy? This guy's weird. This guy's crazy." He's, he's, he's insane. He's, he, what, what, what's going on here? But if you know something about that background and that history, then you will appreciate the Saul Guerrero that you see in Rogue One all the more. And I, quite frankly, found nothing wrong with this character in that point. He played the part that he was supposed to play very well. Forrest Whitaker acted that part uh, quite well, in my opinion. And that character fit in quite well with what he was supposed to do. The only thing, as I would say, that I would want to see more of is his relationship with Jen Erso from the time she was a little bitty thing to the time she became a teenage girl and they split off because 
he didn't want her to be captured, so he basically just abandoned her out of the blue. That's what I would like to see more of. If we had seen more about that, I think the character would have made a lot more sense on screen, but I don't think that he makes little to no sense at all if you know something about his background and if you have an understanding of what this person was supposed to be about from the time he is introduced in the Clone Wars to the time you see him in Rogue One. So, director Orson Krennic. As mentioned, as played by Ben Mendelsohn, as mentioned, director Krennic is a classical megalomaniac. And if you watch any types of movies, like uh, some of the James Bond movies, like Dr. No, Goldfinger, uh, or if you watch any number of other movies that, are, that have these kind of classic, uh, classic uh, hero and villain archetypes, if you read uh, you know, your Shakespeare, if you're literate in those regards, uh, Hamlet, uh, King Lear, or other things of this nature, you will see classical archetypes uh, who are megalomaniacal, who believe that uh, the universe revolves around them and that all, all other people and all other things must bow and bend to their will. But of course, generally speaking, they have certain types of flaws. They are trying to be accepted into the upper echelons of society. They want to be the top, they want to be the, the top crust of the crust of all other people who are either beneath them or beside them in some way and director Krennic fits this a type of uh, these types of character tra traits uh, to a T in my opinion which makes him one of the kind of uh, classic villains that you will see in, in any kind of Star Wars movie and as played by Ben Mendelsohn I think this was a very excellent job Director Krennic does, in fact, have an inferiority complex uh, inside the Imperial hierarchy. He is trying to work his way up, some might even say worm his way up, into the Imperial superstructure. Now, he is, in fact, a very brilliant individual, as is seen from the movie, but he, for what, I don't know everything about the Imperial hierarchy. I don't know if it's a caste system in some ways or, or what, but Director Krennic uh, does not occupy a very high position. While he occupies a very high position in terms of the Death Star project, he is the leader, he does not occupy a high position in terms of his acceptability. You see in the movie that Grand Moff Tarkin treats him with a great deal of condescension. Uh, and mock, mocking him. Uh, you see that uh, in some, several times that Tarkin tries to assume authority over the Death Star project and take it away from Director Krennic and you see Krennic fighting back against this move and you see Krennic trying to weasel his way uh, into getting an audience say for example with Emperor Palpatine so that he can explain uh, the importance of the Death Star project to the Emperor directly face to face and he could explain his significance to uh, the success of the Death Star project to Palpatine so that he can have an audience, an ear, the ear of the Emperor in this regard. And you see that in a very poignant scene in Rogue One, which we're going to get to later when we talk about someone else of very strong significance who shows up. Those of you who've seen the movie, you know who I'm talking about, and I can't wait to talk about it myself. Anyway, so, Director Krennic, um, he has this inferiority complex, okay? And it's, it's very plain when uh, Tarkin uh, tries to take the Death Star program away from him, and he gets absolutely enraged, which I really enjoyed that scene. And he tries to confront Tarkin right here in the front of everybody about this. I actually kind of thought, you know, Tarkin was going to slap him down and maybe some, some of these other troopers were going to do something to Director Krennic at that point. I don't know, shovel rifle butt in his stomach or something like that. That would have been kind of interesting, but you don't see that. And I think that that was actually a good thing that they did not do that. But uh, Krennic uh, also has a very uh, long and abiding relationship with Galen Erso and his family. And I, for one, have not read the Catalyst movie, which is a kind of a, a primer to Rogue One, but I understand from that from that novel that you get the impression that uh, Director Krennic rescued Galen Erso and his family from some kind of slavery, and because of that, uh, Galen Erso is basically uh, indentured to Krennic's service thereafter, and Krennic, realizing the absolute brilliance that Galen Erso possesses, attempts to uh, enlist him to help him work on the Death Star program. Okay, so that's my understanding of that point. But director Krennic, as played by Ben Mendelsohn, was an awesome character in my opinion. Kind of a typical 
uh, megalomaniacal bad guy, but played very well and has especially played off the other characters, especially when he tries to confront uh, Jen Erso on that platform and he asks her, who are you? And she says, I'm the daughter of Galen Erso. There's this absolute utter look of surprise in his face. And then when he finally meets his death by at the, basically at the hands of his own weapon, when the Death Star is aimed at uh, Scarif and he is aimed at that Imperial base and he's looking up uh, at the Death Star in orbit and as it's, it's getting ready to fire on the planet you see this look on his face that says here I am about to die by my own weapon. I'm about to be killed by my own weapon, the weapon that I created, that I have invested so much time in trying to use it to get favor and position inside the imperial hierarchy in, with the emperor himself and here I am about to be killed by the device that I myself have created. The absolute irony of that uh, when I was watching that on screen and watching how Ben Mendelsohn played that in director Krennic uh, did not escape me. And, and I have to say I really enjoyed the character of director Krennic. I thought that he was one of the more developed characters as he should have been in this storyline as the antagonist to the protagonist of Jin Erso and ultimately to the ensemble protagonists of Rogue One uh, as a squad.